if I would summarize, find someone that you know for a long time, uh, someone that you you trust and they trust you. You like them and they like you um, because it's a very bumpy road, um, regardless of what you're doing. Uh, look at Uber today. There are reports that talks about this is a failing business and it is never going to be profitable. You know, put yourself in the CEO position. It's uh, you're always going to be you're always going to feel lonely if you don't have this good partner that helps you through those down times, even for a well-established company like Uber, your business is going to fail. Most of uh, what exists in the universe, our actions and all other forces, resources and ideas has little value and it yields little results. On the other hand. A few things work fantastically well and have tremendous impact. Richard Kosh. Keeping this thought in mind, we all know that uh, there are hundreds of forces around us and uh, trying to be occupied always 24 by 7. And sometimes we miss out those essential things which really matters. It's very important to have that focus and determination, which yield the results which you are envisioning in the future. Today, we are in conversation with Ahmed Farag. He is co-founder, CEO, and head of product at PortMe. CEO and head of engineering at Facegraph as well. So he has two companies here. He used to work in Microsoft, I think close to 12 years, if I'm not wrong. Uh, Ahmad Farag, welcome to the show. Hey, hey, Saur. <clears throat> Saur, thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. So what is Port Me and Facegraph if you uh, help uh, me and our listeners and viewers to understand? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, maybe we'll start with Port Me, which is the most recent uh, venture or one of the most recent ventures I'm working on. So Port Me is a marketplace uh, for instant virtual college visits. So essentially, just to break it down, it's an app you can download on the phone. And, uh, you know, it's it's really suited for those high schoolers, senior high school, uh, you know, students who are planning or in the process of thinking about applying to colleges. Um, oftentimes, you'd have maybe like six or seven colleges that you have listed as, uh, you know, your target. And some of them may not be in town. So they will require you to go out of town to see them. And it's really common for you to see the the college before joining, before, you know, the university. So what app does allows you to punch in the name of uh, that university or school, um, just like you do in, in an Uber app. You just put in the address or the name, and then it would locate a student who is currently in that university, who's able to do an instant live video session like we do now, and they can answer your questions. And more ideally, they can show you around. So... It's not going to be the first time you see the dorms when you go there, uh, and you're not going to rely on the outdated information on the internet. In that case, that student who's making that live session, uh, they will pay a dollar a minute. And the student who's delivering the session, they'll take 80 cents out of that dollar. Mm. So that's for me. Okay. So before you move to phase graph, um, this uh, model which you mentioned about uh, the students and and going through different colleges and universities uh, do you have other offerings or this is the only thing at this time no no this is a good question so so this is you know port me eventually is going to be a platform for helping people making instant decisions quickly so we want people to have the ability uh, to make uh, you know quicker and more accurate decisions and the way we think about this the best way that a lot of people do, you know, decisions quickly um, and more informed decisions is with information. People want to have access to information immediately and information that can be verified. And normally human, and you started with talking about human, human trust their eyes. They want to see things for their own eyes. So we think by having the ability to give you a platform where you can request sort of like a cameraman to any location that you have a desire to see to make a decision, uh, we will solve that problem. We'll, we'll provide or disrupt the market of making decisions. So uh, I think your question is really clever. I mean, definitely this is the start. We're going to start with students to help them make mm-hmm. their life decision of joining universities. But we are 
working behind the scenes to make this, uh, you know, work for any other, uh, you know, type of decision. So if you're going to a hotel and you read some reviews on the hotel that tells you the pool can be, you know, cold at times, or maybe the bar is crowded and you can't verify that information. You just create a request with someone who's there or close by, and they can walk in there and show you the bar. So you can make your decision quicker. This can apply to insurance, uh, buying a house and few other things. Great. So how it's different from like 3D views, what we see, for example, you mentioned about uh, uh, going to see the house or maybe some buildings in that way. So how it's different from having a 3D view versus uh, what you mentioned about a student will go and have some live feeds out there. Yeah, excellent. <clears throat> I think it's, you know, we think about it as complementary. We don't see it, um, you know, as something that would uh, compete. Um, mm -hmm. The 3D models, like virtual tours uh, or, or even existing videos on YouTube. Now, YouTube can do like 3D tours where you can use like, you know, multiple cameras and you can just go around. All of this is great, right? But the problem is you don't really guarantee that it will cover exactly what you need. Um, so, you know, just to give you an example, if I am, if I'm, if I want to see a house to buy a house, I can see the video that that's posted. I can see the virtual tour. They do drone pictures now and videos. Everything is pretty cool. Right. But what if I want to see like a specific area and the, I want to see how the attic is done? Like, I want to see, um, how did they do the, uh, you know, the first floor, uh, flooring, right? Just, I want to, so imagine you have someone walking in there. Or imagine yourself walking in there and just going to that particular place that you want to spend five minutes on. You can't do this for pre-recorded pre or pre-existing uh, pre content, right? But you can do it through the phone. Yes. And you're not going to travel all that place, just to, you know, all that distance just to do that. So having the ability to have someone do it for you, um, I think it's going to be really, really important. Yeah, I think that completely makes sense now. Uh, people have to travel far places. Uh, I know a few of my friends who have to go, for example, the, the college and university you mentioned, uh, they have to really go book the tickets and all the logistics and I'd really uh, included with that. I think uh, Port Me would be an excellent uh, alternative uh, to not even going there. And as you mentioned, you can spend more time on those spots or places uh, which you really would like to know more about it. So that's that's great. So let's let's move over to uh, FaceGraph. So what's what's this company is all about? Yeah. So you talked about FaceGraph in the beginning in the intro. So I am not really the CEO anymore. So I used to be the CEO for almost four years. Um, I was fortunate mm -hmm. enough to find a new leadership. So we have a new CEO who took over in March. <clears throat> so I'm currently um, sort of like acting CTO, uh, helping with uh, a little bit of engineering. Um, and we have a leadership that takes the company now forward, uh, to new places. So FaceGraph is, um, a, a facility management cloud solution, um, and, uh, devices. So we built a SaaS platform that allows, uh, three main, uh, sectors to be able to manage their facilities. The first one is education sector. So if you have a school, university, um, daycare, um, you can have uh, our SaaS platform deployed, have your students, teachers, uh, employees in the system, and then you can take their attendance. You can also control access to doors and so on. You, and then we have other things like launch ordering system and a few other things that, that really pertains to schools and education. And if you are a business who has an office, uh, we call you, you know, we call that category workplaces. Um, and mm -hmm. a good example of, of this would be like warehouses or even like companies that have, uh, you know, developers or offices. Um, and that would be the workplaces. They can obviously do, uh, attendance for employees. Uh, you know, in, in, in the COVID era, they can also take temperature. Uh, and then they can, they can automate payroll and a few other things for, for their facility. And lastly, we support, support facilities. So sport facilities and health clubs would be uh, obviously gyms and, and health clubs, and they can manage membership, access to the, uh, the facility and a few other things. So around those three, you know, main sectors, we have verticals where we keep building additional mm -hmm. features. I think the marquee thing that we have, and it's probably in the name is we, uh, we claim that we've done, um, you know, a great implementation of facial recognition. 
that makes facial recognition safe. So it's not invasive um, and it doesn't compromise the privacy, but in the same time, make it really, really effective. Meaning, um, you know, if you're gonna, for example, use facial recognition to record the student's activity, you know, my son ate today, my son went to the bathroom, he's happy, he's sad. Uh, it will do it with almost 100% accuracy and it doesn't require a lot of human intervention. So you're not going to have to stand in front of the machine for 10 seconds and press buttons. It's all seamless. <laughs> Excuse me. It's all seamless. So mm -hmm. uh, that's what face, face graph in a nutshell. Perfect. So uh, what I recall, face graph is your first company and then uh, you founded uh, PortMe. Is that correct? Yeah. I, you know, my face mm -hmm. graph is my second company in the US. Um, okay. So I, I had a company before that called Software Ranger. I still have it. Um, you know, this is more of, um, it's like, uh, an IT service provider company and I still have it. It makes a little bit of profit. Um, so it's not really mm -hmm. losing. Um, and it's a good way to optimize your taxes. Uh, I still have it running since 2010. So I would mm, say it's okay. the second company I've done here in the US. Perfect. So, uh, these companies, uh, which, uh, as you mentioned in the U S so are all these uh, products only, uh, operating in the U S or North American region, or they can be, uh, I mean, operated in other countries at this point. Yeah. So face graph, um, is probably the most grown venture that I have so far. Um, and it did, uh, it did grow outside the U S so most of our customer customers today are in the U.S. and Canada, um, but we do have customers um, almost in 26 countries. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in Europe, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, in Africa, a little bit in the Middle East. So um, and we've built it in a way that uh, it does support other countries. Uh, it's, you know, for example, the devices that we produce uh, support six languages. The software support three languages. Um, so it does have the ability to cross uh, to cross borders. Um, and we are um, so we've been like once we re once we released our product line and we started working on like the roadmap of internationalization, supporting other uh, nations. You know, our idea was to bring this, this uh, technology to, you know, any other country that can use it. And we focused on, uh, you know, like we attended a lot of conferences and events, um, you know, worldwide. So we attended, like we were regular, uh, attendee of a conference in the UK and also one in Dubai. What we're doing these days is we're trying to actually focus more on the U S customer and we're trying to grow in the, in the government business. Okay. So. Regarding these uh, startups, uh, is it uh, we, maybe we can go to a bit of a flashback and uh, and understand how all these things started? Because in our podcast, it's very important that uh, we pay more weightage or more time on the process and results. Everyone knows about like you have a company and uh, you must have faced a lot of challenges, self-doubt. Uh, different kind of stress or pressures every around <laughs> every day. <laughs> so, so help us walk through when you started your first company, you always have that entrepreneurial mindset or something triggered and uh, where exactly, how, how exactly it started? Maybe I would say like that. I think the, the first time I had those serious thoughts about creating a business, uh, mm -hmm. you know, was around college time. And I, you know, I'm someone who was, so I'm originally from Egypt. I was born in Saudi Arabia because my parents lived there and I lived there almost 18 years. And then when I started going to college, I went back to Egypt. Um, and I, you know, from that time, because you are in your own country, um, it's probably easier for you to do business, you would think, right? So I started thinking like, it's pretty cool to make money. Like, I, I mean, that was something that it's always in my mind that I, it's time for me now that I'm in the, in my twenties to just, uh, like, I don't want to rely on my father. Let me, let me just bring some money. And in the mm -hmm. same time, I had the love for software. So I was building software and stuff. So I did little things here and there. I also did a few, like a few business things with my brothers. Um, but then, uh, you know, I remember the first serious business I started was a company called Blink. Uh, and that was in England. 
And it was with an English partner that I met, uh, you know, in the in the course of my work uh, in England. And basically, we wanted to build a YouTube for educational videos. So that was my first ever venture that actually required me to leave my full time job. So I left my my second or third full time job I had after college it was a big compromise. I had nightmares every day uh, and we started Blink and we failed. OK, so you so let me just unwrap a few things and uh, I would help. Uh, I, I would say I, need, I seek help to uh, get some more clarification. So you mentioned that this is not something uh, sometimes what we say, the entrepreneurial seizure that automatic. I mean, all of a sudden I want to start a company. So you were having some uh, different levels of initiatives from the starting. And you mentioned that. Uh, you have the inclination toward business. So you, you did have some full-time job, but then you were coming out and, and trying something new and uh, you fail. Now, what, what is the uh, consequence of that? Some people failed and they get into the oblivion. They get into a certain kind of uh, depressions and, and stop believing in themselves. But now as I'm talking to you, uh, you are definitely not in that category. So how, how exactly you, uh, did you see as a learning thing from that failure or help us walk through what, what, what kind of a mindset you got, uh, at that particular uh, period of time? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think that might help a lot of people who also want to start a business or in the middle of, uh, doing their own thing. Um, so, you know, and that's something I also talk about in my, my videos as well. I think the most important period of, in my opinion, the most important period of life is from 20 to 30. Um, my first venture was in that twenties. I, I'm, you know, even though I say I feel now, it doesn't feel like I felt the failure so much at the time. And just because in the twenties, you have so much energy, you have so much risk taking, you have very little obligations, little, very little responsibilities, right? So what did I do to do this business? I gave away like a very good job for me at the time. I was working for HP uh, in Egypt, pays really well, you know, send us to the UK and Netherlands. So I resigned from that job and I started doing this uh, for three months and we failed. Um, and luckily we failed quickly. And within three months, I think my learning was um, that, you know, things can go wrong and, um, you know, you probably have to do better planning. You have to do, uh, you have to be more dedicated. See, the thing is no. And, and I always say this, nobody sat down with me before I approached the 20 and told me, Hey, by the way, twenties are really important. So yeah. I was just a 20 kid. I was having fun. <laughs> so I wasn't really just doing business. I was having fun. And, um, I think if I toned down the fun a little bit, I might have been more successful. <clears throat> That's one of the things. The other thing, the other thing is, and this is something you're going to see almost constantly in all of my businesses. I was the only person who's full time. I'm always dedicated to what I'm doing, but the other people were not full time. And um, I think that's the other thing that I learned. I always hear about this. Um, I always read about this and uh, which is you have to be dedicated. Uh, and I always talk to myself about like, okay, but maybe what if you can do this on the side? I think I learned that being dedicated is really, really important, at least in the first stages. So that was the other learning. Having everybody committed and being full-time in the beginning is really key. However, there are exceptions. So, I mean, a good exception, a good exception would be what I've done with FaceGraph. It's very painful. I've done a little bit of it while I was, uh, you know, full-time. <clears throat> However, I would, if I would go back, uh, I would just be full-time. So, so what kind of challenges uh, you face? Like there may be number of challenges. I was talking to one of the other founder and he mentioned that I can sometime, if I get some time, I can even write a book about what kind of challenges I have faced. And I think this resonates with a lot of uh, startup and, and founders. So uh, I may not ask you to kind of uh, go on a monologue for the long, but I, I just want to ask you about what are the key challenges you have faced, which would you would like to share with us? 
Okay, <clears throat> that's a good question. So, I mean, there's so many challenges. Uh, there are a lot of challenges. I would say everything is a challenge, but maybe I'll try yeah. to pick the important ones that I think that would make or break your company. I think the I think the first challenge would be um, you'll always see people categorized in two buckets. Um, at least in in my world, where in the in the world of the businesses I'm doing, you either a technical person, and in technical here I mean a person who's knowledgeable about the know how of the business. So it doesn't have to be technical, meaning a computer person. If you're doing a restaurant, a technical person would be the person who knows how to cook. And then the other side will be a business person, right? So you may have a technical person or uh, a business person. In in the ventures that I did, or most of them, it was. I'm, I'm, I'm the technical person because I am the software developer. And, um, you know, what I found is a good challenge to solve for is if you are a technical person, you definitely need to have a good business person. Um, not, yes, you can learn, but sometimes, um, it doesn't, you know, at the early stage, if you want to have someone who knows, who knows the business side is going to be important and vice versa. If you're a business person, um, you need to have a technical person. So one of the challenges I had, because, uh, the way I, you know, the focus of my study and the type of friends I have, most of us were technical people. So, you know, I'm a human, I'll just find some cool people that have time that I like and they like me and I'll just say, hey, let's just come, come on board. So usually the founders you're going to pick with you, if your, if your circle is all technical, will be all technical. I think that was one of the challenges. And if I would go back, I would think about this again and again. Um, so finding, you know, I think the one, one of the most important things about startups um, is the people. I think having the right person um, will make your startup succeed. Most likely it will make your startup succeed more important than the idea and uh, probably more important than anything else. So, um, so that's one challenge. I think the other challenge was because I wasn't a business person. Um, sometimes I'm thinking from technical perspective in terms of, uh, you know, let's try to be cheap. Let's try not to, you know, we don't need to raise funding. Maybe we can do it on our own. So things like this, uh, a lot of time don't help you depending on your business. Um, so that was the other challenge. Um, you know, what is the right thing for the company that should be done, um, in terms of business, business side? Yes. Uh, I think uh, that is something which I have found a pretty common answer. Uh, from most of the people who are starting a, a business, finding right person on board. Yes. Uh, because as I always say, no man is island. Uh, they need help. And on the top of that, uh, they need to find, or they have to find person or people who share the mindset, who share that enthusiasm, who share that energy that let's do it. Uh, and I think that is one of the most difficult part of any leader to find right people. And at the same time, keeping the same energy level throughout. And you might see that life happens uh, for everyone. If you are energized, maybe someone else is dealing with some other personal issues at the same time. So <coughs> how you manage those things? Uh, I know there is no right and wrong answer, but what's your perspective when people try to look for and uh, look out for the right people to be on board as a part of this long journey. Yeah. <clears throat> so, excuse me. I was hoping I was hoping that question is going to come because I do have a perspective <laughs> here, yeah. and it is certainly something that has changed in my mindset. My my original mindset, the the thing that I thought it was the correct thing is, uh, say I'm building a house, um, I would look for a good builder, and obviously. It would be great if that good, build, good builder is a friend of mine or someone who has acquaintance with, I know them, so then we can have a good relationship. Um, and if I am building, let's say, an IT company, I need to do marketing, I need to find a good marketing person. What I found out, that is wrong. Actually, that's not the right thing to do. Um, and I learned by experience, like I learned by experience and I also <laughs> followed few, uh, entrepreneurs in the, in the, in the Silicon Valley specifically talk about this. 
and talk about it in an opinion that I think really makes sense. And, I, and that's what I adopted recently. The most important thing you find in a person is what you just mentioned just before that, just before that question. Um, it is basically, you need to find someone who has the passion and who has, um, you like to work with that person, meaning it doesn't matter what kind of skill they have. Don't, don't make the skills num the number one uh, qualifier for your search. The number one qualifier should be someone who uh, you enjoy working with a lot and you know that they will persevere with you. They'll, they'll take all the challenge and continue to be with you. They'll help you. They'll support you in this journey. And for the second qualifier, which is skills, I mean, obviously, if they have the skill, that would be great. But if they don't, everybody learns at the job. That is totally fine. Uh, I mean, obviously, you don't want to get someone who's completely off and away from what you need to do. But in, but there are exceptions. Sometimes you do this and sometimes it works really well. So if I would summarize, find someone that you know for a long time, uh, someone that you, you trust and they trust you, you like them and they like you, um, because it's a very bumpy road, um, regardless of what you're doing. Uh, look at Uber today. There are reports that talks about this is a failing business and it is never going to be profitable. You know, put yourself in the CEO position. It, it's, uh, you're always going to be, you're always going to feel lo lonely. If you don't have this good partner that helps you through those down times, even for a well-established company like Uber, your business is going to fail. And then, Oh yeah, you need marketing. You need someone who knows how to build a house. They will learn on the job. Yeah. I think what you just mentioned is so profound that uh, being a CEO or being a, a leader uh, of a company or a business, it's, it's a lonely road most of the time because there are so much accountability on you and accountability is uh, something by default human being would try to get away from. So uh, if something goes right, people would be with you. And as you mentioned about Uber, if something is going wrong, then yeah, CEO or any other top executives, they are the first people who would be really impacted by that. So that brings me to the ideology or uh, I would say a philosophy part of uh, the leadership. So if you would like to summarize in terms of what leadership means to you, what, what's your philosophy? Because there are so many things which comes, but what is your philosophy or mission statement define who you as a person is and try to bring you again back to the track if you're just trying to pull away from different directions out there. So what, what's your philosophy of leadership? Yeah, that's a very deep question. So uh, philosophy or leadership. I think the most important thing about a leader um, is, you know, the ability to, to, to work with people. Like the people's skills is really important. Um, having the ability to do empathy, uh, understanding, you know, the people around you. Because, I mean, leadership, what does that mean? I mean, you, you essentially um, make decisions. And those decisions are going to matter for whatever you're managing or leading. And without having the right type of information and having the right responses uh, and then avoiding having decision fatigue, you will probably fail in what you're doing. And if we apply this to managing just a business without a people, um, it applies, right? So you need information to make good decisions. The same thing with people. If you lead people, you need to have the type, the good type of connections and empathy so you can read those people and have them, uh, you know, move forward. I think, um, you know, what, you know, and there's so much out there about like leadership and how, you know, you want to lead by example and all of that. I think what really matters, uh, you know, to me is, uh, you know, the ability to, Number one, understand the people really well. So you put the right person in the right task. Um, I remember a lot of times uh, when people come to me, uh, you know, let's say engineering manager, they come and say, hey, person X is not working well. I mean, I think we need to replace person X. And I'm like, we failed to put him in the right place. 
because I've seen, and I remember, it's kind of funny. Look, I, I know a lot of people um, that a lot of students that were my classmates in college, um, they were kind of at the bottom of the class. And I know that some of them have made it so big, big companies, big bucks, right? Um, and, and vice versa, like, you know, top, top class, normal life. So what I learned, and this is fascinating to me. Cause, cause you, you know, everybody's judgmental, right? And it's not a good thing, but you would just say, Oh, person X, person Y, this is going to be a, that, that guy's top class. That's going to be a, that's going to be a Harvard student. He's going to have a great job. Right. And then, you know, 10 years later, you come and see something different. Right. So I always think about, okay, what is, what is it that's, you know, what's going on? It's really about if I'm a successful leader, I always hire someone who tells me what to do not the vice versa. So I hire someone who tells me, okay, look, this is how you do it. If I tell them what to do, then I know that I failed. Number two, I need to set people for success. I need to find the right thing for the person to do. And I need to make sure that it's clear. And then I need to make sure they succeed in what they're doing. I think that's what, uh, you know, what makes leadership successful. Uh, more than just like the common things that we know that leading by example. So I need to know what I'm doing so I can do it. And then I can do it well. So other people can learn from me. Yeah. So as you mentioned, having an empathy, be humble, and then try to have that uh, learning mindset and hire people who may have uh, critical thinking, who can challenge uh, what you are proposing, for example. Those are the people uh, you will definitely look for. And, so and learning yourself. Yeah. Like one, one thing, if I may add, uh, Saurabh. Yeah. This is something I'm trying to teach my my kids as well as myself. Um, you know, especially when you grow older, you'll notice that uh, there are times where you're at the high of your day or at the high of your week and vice versa. You'll be at the low of your week or the low of the day. You need to recognize that you need to be really aware of your state of mind because we're when you are in the low of the day or the low of the week, don't make decisions. Because you will make the wrong decisions, you know, whether positive or negative decisions, hiring, firing, whatever. And the more, and I, it's kind of funny because I, I try to even speak to myself and say, Hey, look, uh, Ahmed, you, you're actually, you're having a bad day. Maybe, maybe, you know, let's not think about the decision today. So that's really important. Just recognize your state of mind and maybe sometimes postpone re your reactions. Um, you know, if if you're not in, in a good day number two be aware of uh, you know decision fatigue um a human brain is just like a machine um it, it just becomes tired if you make too many decisions in a day you'll become tired so if, if there are important decisions um make them in the in the early morning in the time where you have the high of your day and then don't make too many of them uh, because you'll end up making poor decisions. And I think Jeff Bezos talks about that a little bit in in, uh, in some of his uh, online uh, interviews. He talks about it really well. Uh, you know, the more you grow in leadership, the more you make just decisions. And you need to make quality decisions. The way to do that is to make less decisions. Try to, um, you know, try to... Uh, to give more power to the people under you. Delegate and let them make decisions and keep the important ones to yourself. That's great advice. I think that's very insightful and deep. Uh, you mentioned that we have to be self-aware. After all, we are human being and we should not be uh, at our at the high level every time. So that's, that's so uh, insightful advice. L let's go to the, uh, the other section about the uh, the artificial intelligence and uh, the machine learning. And there are a lot of talks about different organizations about uh, incorporating them. But at the same time, there are uh, some negative side of uh, those things as well. So as you yourself being a part of the AI and maybe the machine learning model as well, incorporating in your, uh, in your uh, company, how would you see that, uh, uh, the usage of artificial intelligence or machine learning in our society. Yeah, um, I think I maybe I'll, I can comment a little bit about the the bad side of AI, um, and then and then talk about the second part of your question, which is like you know wh where is it in society? I think one of the things that was profound for me uh, that I learned, uh, I heard a lot about 
bias in, in AI. Like I read about it, I've seen what companies do to try to mitigate it. But what was interesting that I was impacted by it. Uh, and when I say I, I mean the business face graph. So I remember at our early version in 2018, uh, we, the first product we got out was, uh, you know, uh, an application called smile me in. It allows you to do attendance using facial recognition. We rolled it out for students and schools. We noticed, and we started with the, you know, customer base in, in California, and then we expanded to the entire U S. So we noticed that, um, in certain schools in the West coast, we had a very poor, uh, results for recognizing the people who have a very white skin like very, very fair complexion. Um, and later on, when we started rolling out our solution elsewhere in Africa, when the device was used with people who are, who have very dark skin. So the very dark skin and the very white skin, they just failed. And that's when we saw, okay, because most of the training that was done for those models were not these people. Um, and it was super frustrating. Like I remember one of the owners of a, uh, of a school was really white and it never recognized them <laughs> and he was not happy. So, and, and then, you know, obviously what is really amazing looking at the big move and change from 2017 come to today, uh, say 2020, 2020, 2021, the models have improved dramatically that none of this is an issue anymore. And I think having the ability to recognize issues like this, like bias in, in data sets and training, it will help technology. It's not, it's not about like blaming ourselves or blaming the community for doing something wrong. I think it's healthy and it, I think it really helps the AI community. So yes. just to pause a little bit and maybe talk about the, you know, the AI in society, I think, um, Every time we think about uh, technology, I think about my grandmother um, and the older community that, uh, you know, for me, it's older now. They didn't have so much access to technology. If I go back to my, uh, you know, middle school, we didn't have Internet. Uh, so we do research in, in, in libraries and stuff. Right. And then if you fast forward today, uh, technology is everywhere. But what we've noticed that. Technology has become very invasive. Um, if you walk to a gym, uh, you have to scan a barcode now in a lot of places, or sometimes in more advanced places, you use something like, I don't know, facial recognition. I haven't seen that here. Uh, but despite the fact that you have to do these things, you're always faced, oh, you go to the airport, uh, you know, the advanced airports now, they do facial recognition, they do iris scan, some of them. And notice all of those have big devices, and these big devices have some sort of routine that you have to do to adapt to the machine. If you would replace all these technologies today and go back to the, the let's say, early 80s or 70s uh, or even 50s, you'll have an actual person. So I always tell my my members in FaceGraph, um, if I build a school and I want to protect that school from having unauthorized people to get in, or I want to record who came in and who left, in the in the 50s, I'll have someone sit there and they will come in. Someone will come in, let's say a teacher or a student. They'll walk in. Uh, that person will just see that person and, you know, they'll just recognize who they are, write their name. But if you put a machine today that does facial recognition, um, you know, you have to come stand in front of the machine. You probably have to wait a little bit. You have to stay in a specific spot where the machine is. Same thing with the airport, right? And you have to pause. You have to wait. It has to tell you, okay, go ahead. Um, and humans don't do that. If you go to, a, you know, if you go to a school, the fifties, a person won't come to you and just ask you to stand in a square and just keep looking at your face up and down and then write <laughs> your name. They don't do that, right? That's too yeah. invasive. That's too weird. So I think. With the introduction and improvement of machine learning and AI, reaching that ability where uh, technology is ubiquitous, ubiquitous and very, very seamless, not invasive. And I think Satya Nadell talked about that a lot as well, uh, where it's almost like ambient, like it's in the background. You don't feel it. We're going to be there. Uh, and a, a very good example would be like what we're doing today in FaceGraph, where we're eliminating all the devices and all the machines, and we're just going to rely on existing CCTV camera cameras in the on the campus just to know you came in and what time you came in, so we can log your attendance. So this way, you don't have to do anything. You just go walk, do your business, leave. We will see the first time you came in, the last time you left. Then we know your 
you came in and left. This is only possible with very good machine learning. Um, you know, the ability to do detect the face uh, at a distance and also improve the image and also do facial 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 recognition, the search of the, the face. Got it. Yep. So I think you're right. There's no absolute place of AI at this time. There's no perfect state, but it's keep on evolving. So as you mentioned, you face some challenges about the skin color, how the AI was uh, not functioning as the way it's supposed to, and then you rectified that and it's much in a better uh, place. So yeah, it, it just keep on the journey and, and that will definitely uh, place it on the positive side, which all uh, everyone would like to be on. So let's move on to the last part here, which I ask all my guests. Uh, first thing is, if someone would like to reach out, what are the best mediums uh, they can reach out to you? And the second question is, if uh, anyone after uh, listening or watching to this podcast would like to reach out in terms of, uh, let me just talk to Ahmed about the idea I have. What's your suggestion before people reach out to those ideas or mentorships or those kind of things? Yeah. So in terms of the best way to reach out to me, um, I think just uh, sending me an email is the best way. Uh, you know, it's A-H-M-E-D Ahmed at port-me.com. Uh, I'm one of those who reply to his email heavily. Um you know, send me an email. I'm happy to help. Obviously, you can find you can find me on Twitter um, and Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn. Uh, most of my handles are my first name, dot last name. So Ahmed Farag, Ahmed Farag. Um, and I also respond to those, uh, but less less often than than emails. In terms of advice, um, I think uh, so. Obviously, I would welcome anybody to reach out to me and ask me about ideas. Uh, you'll find that I am really um, consistent uh, on usually I'll always try to find the best thing in your idea. Very rarely I have turned down an idea. Actually, I think almost none. <laughs> like if anybody tells me an idea, I'll tell them, oh, that's great. And then I'll try to think about what's, <laughs> what's good. What's the good angle about it? Because I think ideas don't matter. I think what matters are people. Uh, you can have the greatest idea in the world, but you can't build it or you don't execute on it, then it ends up being nothing, right? Uh, and I also recognize that I had a lot of ideas in the past and I walked to a lot of people and they just shut me down completely. <laughs> you know, they'll tell me, oh, but didn't so-and-so did this idea before? Oh, but how would that work? This is just a failure. And, and some of those actually worked, you know, and I, I wouldn't say it was easy. You know, it was challenging, mm -hmm. but... I was adamant. I had the perseverance. Look, I think if you work on anything, anything at all, um, it will work. You just put your effort on it. You make it work. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't have to prove that. Right. So look at like Slack, Teams, you know, you know, uh, um, Zoom, all of those, they all do this similar things. All of them are successful. All of them are making money, right? I mean, yeah. are they going to be a unicorn or some of them are unicorns? Well, that's a different story. But can you succeed doing something that already exists? Yes, you can. Um, can you succeed by doing something that doesn't exist? Yes, you can. What's important is you need to have the right people and then you have to have the energy, power, perseverance. Now, the second part is advice. I really hardly find an advice related to an idea um, that, you know, there is no like one advice fits all. I think the best people who talk about this is not me because I am, uh, I don't think I'm not there yet, but you know, you can talk to, for example, Michael Seibel, the CEO of YC, uh, you know, obviously Paul, Paul Graham, the founder of YC and, and, and few others, you know, there are a few people, um, you know, from that school, I'll call it the Silicon Valley Entrepreneurship School. They all talk about how you can't find one advice fits all. And I, I truly believe that. Like, I tried this myself. Like, I would just work on a startup and then I go sit with a startup advisor. He'll tell me, oh, you're raising too little. How about you just go big? If you go big, you can bring more money. Then I go big <laughs> and it doesn't work. <laughs> then someone else will say, oh, you're raising too much. Just go, go, go small. So those, I would just warn you against those advices. Those, that advice, it may work, it may not. 
It, it doesn't work that way. I think everybody has a different situation. If you want to get an advice, if you're building a house and somebody built a house before, they'll give you something technical on building the house. Well, that's a good advice. But just a general startup advice. Yeah, take it with grain of salt. Think about it. Not everything applies, including what I said in this uh, podcast. <laughs> exactly. So basically uh, what you mentioned that uh, ideas, uh, people should not be judgmental and specifically from your side, you always try to explore ideas and then try to provide some insights and find some good things about it and then advice based on that. And uh, people definitely can and try to uh, take those advice and, and build upon that. So that being said, uh, Ahmed, it, it was a very fantastic uh, discussions uh, discussion here today. And I found a lot of things uh, pretty insightful. So thank you so much for your time today. So very nice to have me on uh, your podcast. I hopefully we'll uh, talk to you again sometime soon.